Okay, in this video, we will be covering um, 13.8 extrema of functions of two variables. So, um, again, as always, you always want to make sure that you watch the or view the lecture slides before coming in to view the video on how to work out the examples because I will be using a lot of that information. Um, to be to to start on these problems. Okay, so. For number one, let's go ahead and look at number one. And there is a hint there for number nine. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. So it says, identify any extrema of the function by recognizing its given form or its form after completing the square. View your results um, by using the partial derivatives to locate any critical points or tests uh, for a relative extrema, okay? So um, essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this function from number one. Let's see what we've got here. G of x, y equal to x minus five squared plus y minus one squared. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna find the partial derivative with respect to x. And when we do that, this is gonna become two x minus five to the one power and then the derivative of what's inside is just one. And then the derivative of all this second term with respect to x is gonna be zero because there's no x's in it, okay? So um, if I simplify this, that will give me two x minus 10. And then if I set g of x equal to zero, that would give me two x minus 10 equal to zero, which means x would equal five. So my critical number is going to be at x equals five, okay? And it looks like I have the answers all here. Um, I did not intend to do it that way. So let me get out of here. because I did not want all the answers in there. It may change my first problem for me, but that's okay. So let me go to our class and just click on 13.8. I don't want to view it as an instructor. I wanted to view it as a student, right? Um, that's probably why you were looking at it like, why does it look a little different? Because <laughs> I was in the wrong view. So if I go into WebAssign, like the way you would go into WebAssign, the assignment opens up as a student view for me. And, and then it looks a lot more like what you see when you open the assignment. There we go. That's more of what it looks like when you open the assignment. So let's look at number one. And again, that hint for number nine is in the description. You do have to click the drop down arrow. So if they change the numbers on me, I'm going to change my numbers just because I want to type my answer in there and see if it's actually correct. Okay. Um, and they have minus three. So then I'm going to bring my power down. This is going to be x minus one. And then the derivative of x minus one with respect to x is just one. And the derivative of this whole term with respect to x is still zero. But when I distribute that two, I get two x minus two. And so if I set g of x equal to zero, I get two x minus two equal to zero. And then in that case, x would just equal one. That would become positive two and then divide by this coefficient would give me a positive one. So now we're gonna do the same thing, but for the partial derivative with respect to y. So the derivative of all of this term would be zero because there's no y's in it. Plus bring down my power, decrease the power by one, and then multiply by the chain rule, which is just one. So ultimately this is just two x minus six. And if I set gy equal to zero, that means I need to set 2x minus 6 equal to 0, which means that y, not x, where did I get x from? It should have been y. It's 2y and then minus 6. So then I should be setting 2y minus 6 equal to 0, and I will get y equals positive 6 divided by 2 is 3. I'll get positive 3, okay? So apparently, 
there is a um, maximum or minimum going on here at this point. Now, there is a way to know whether it's a maximum or minimum. Now they're telling us to um, use like what we know, this is usually like the graph of a sphere and we use what we know about the graphs of the sphere to uh, figure everything out. But on all honestly, I wouldn't even worry about that. I would just go ahead and apply the second derivative test, okay, the second partial derivative test. So I would go ahead and find gxx, find gxy, and find gyy, and then figure out that determinant or discriminant, I can't remember what word they use, but you're going to find d, right? And d is um, gxx times gxy, or I'm sorry, gyy, minus gxy squared. And then we know that if it is um, greater than zero, it's a uh, minimum. If it's less than zero, then it's a maximum. And then if it equals zero, it's going to be, um, actually I'm lying, that's not how it breaks down. If it equals zero, it's indeterminate. We don't know what's happening if it equals zero. I can't fit the word in there, but indeterminate. You can't, you won't know whether it's a max or a min or not. But if D is less than zero, then you have to look at FXX or GXX, whatever the variable is, okay? If GXX is um, less than zero, then it will be a maximum, okay? But if D is less than zero and FXX is greater than zero, then it will be a minimum. And then, I'm sorry, it should be greater. And then if D is less than zero negative, it would be a saddle point. You don't even need to look at um, F double X, okay? Um, so that's kind of like the summary. I'm sorry, it takes me a little while. I always have to remember, and I didn't quite remember it. I should have looked it up before I came in here and started recording, my bad, sorry. Um, but from based off of my memory, this seems to be correct. I might wanna go double check that just to be sure. Um, because I don't want to have the wrong information in the beginning, all the wrong answers. So, I haven't put in the video yet for 3.7, but I'm going to. Oh, let's go look for that test. Dun, dun, dun. Not yet, not yet. Here it is. Okay, greater than zero and fx greater than zero is a min, and then greater than zero, fx less than zero is a max, and then d less than zero is a set of one. Okay, cool. And then inconclusive or indetermined for um, when D equals zero. Okay, great, we're on board. Okay, so it's just a quick little summary of that part. So let's go ahead and find GXX. That means I'm gonna take what I got for GX and I'm gonna find the partial derivative with respect to X, which would be two. Then I'm gonna take the same GX and I'm gonna find the partial derivative with respect to Y. There are no Ys, so I get zero. Then GYY. So look at the derivative with respect to y and take the derivative with respect to y again, I get a two. So then this d value would be two times two minus zero squared, which equals four. This means that d is greater than zero. And fxx, or in this case, gxx, which is two, is also greater than zero. So what that tells me is that this is going to have a minimum, okay? So then under maximum, I'm going to type in D and E because there's no max, just a min. And then it is it want X, Y, and Z. So if I want to calculate Z, I'm going to have to find G of the X value I found was one and the Y value I found was three. 
So if I take G and I plug in these numbers, I'm going to get zero plus zero, which is just zero. So what is the point that they want? They want X equals one, Y equals three, and Z equals zero. So one comma three comma zero. And let's go submit this and see whether or not it will accept my response. Yes, I see the double check. So yay, good deal. Now we're gonna move on to number two. Number two is gonna be a little bit more difficult because of that radical, right? So I'm gonna write f of x, y. And instead of writing the house, I'm gonna write x squared plus y squared plus 81 raised to the one half exponent, okay? And so I'm gonna go ahead and go through that whole process all over again. So we're gonna find f, x. In order to do that, I'm gonna have to bring down the power, keep the base, decrease the power by one, and then multiply by the derivative of the base. With respect to x, it's just two x. And then if I clean this up, these are gonna cancel, and I'm gonna have x in the numerator, and then I'm gonna have this in the denominator. Okay, and if I wanna find the critical points, I need to find out where fx equals zero and where fx is undefined. So essentially what that means is set your numerator equal to zero and then set your denominator equal to zero. So here I got X equal to zero here. I don't know what exactly we're gonna get. I don't think we're gonna get any critical numbers just yet. We're gonna get that X equals plus or minus the square root of negative Y squared minus 81 which actually will give me no answers because y squared is positive, And then you put a negative in front of it. This is a negative number. Minus 81 is an even bigger negative number and you can't take the square root of a negative number. So I'm not gonna get any critical numbers from this second from the denominator, okay? The denominator will never be undefined or the fraction will never be undefined because this is always gonna be positive. Now, f y. So the partial derivative with respect to y. Bring down the power again, keep the base the same, decrease the exponent by one, and then multiply by the derivative of the base. And in this case, with respect to y, would be two y. And so then here, I'm gonna get y over this radical. Again, it will never be undefined. The denominator will always be positive. So really, I just need to set the numerator equal to zero and I get zero, okay? Now, if I wanna know the Z value, I will plug in zero, zero, and zero to calculate the Z. So I get zero squared plus zero squared plus 81 to the one half, which is just nine, okay? So the point in question is zero, zero, nine. I just don't know if it is a maximum or minimum. So I need to do the partial derivatives, okay? Now this is not gonna be fun because you have X's in the top and the bottom and you have Y's in the top and the bottom. So unfortunately it's gonna be ugly, but whatever, we have to do it. Okay, so I'm gonna do, I'm gonna write this as X times X squared plus Y squared plus 81 to the negative one half. Same thing here, I'm gonna do Y, the bottom and negative one half exponent. So when I take the derivative, I'm gonna do the product rule. I'm gonna take the first function times the derivative of the second function. And I'm doing the second partial derivative with respect to x, so I get two x on the inside. Then plus the second factor times the derivative of the first factor, which is just one with respect to X. And so then if I factor out, hmm, this two is gonna cancel with that two, but I'm gonna end up with X squared.
And then if I factor out the common factor, which is x squared plus y squared plus 81 raised to the negative 3 halves, I will have x squared from the first term. And if I'm factoring this out, negative 1 half take out negative 3 halves gives me a positive 1 exponent. So I end up with this. which makes sense because when I multiply that in, I will get the first term. And when I multiply it here, I will have to add the exponents, which does give me negative one half. So what do I end up with? I end up with two X squared plus Y squared plus 81 over mm, X squared plus Y squared plus 81 to the three halves at the bottom. Okay. Now, whether or not that is positive or negative, we'll talk about it in a little bit. So let's keep going. Now we're going to do f, x, y. And then if I were to plug in my point, right, let me actually finish this out. I'm going to need to go to another page, which I'm not going to like. But if I want to do fx x of 0, 0, right? I can only plug in the x and the y. I would get 0, 0, and 81. 0, 0, 81 to the 3 halves. Now, 81 over 81 raised to the 3 halves is actually just 1 ninth. But it's positive, OK? Then now for f of x, y. So I'm going to take the derivative of x, and I'm going to take it, the derivative of it with respect to y. So you get the first factor times the derivative of the second. Times the derivative of the inside with respect to y is 2y. Plus the second factor. times the derivative of the first factor with respect to y is zero. So then I, this term actually goes away and I end up with um, negative xy. Oh, and I should have had a negative over here too. Oh man, that's gonna change things. So if that's a negative x squared, then when I factored out that common factor, it should be negative x squared. So it'll actually cancel that. But when I plug in my 0, 0, I still get 81 over 81 to the 3 halves. So I still get the same values. Luckily, right? Um, I didn't mess it up too much. And then over here, we have, again, this whole thing raised to the 3 halves. So when I plug in 0, 0, I'm going to get 0 in the top and 81 to the 3 halves at the bottom, but 0 over anything is still just 0. Then now I'm going to do x, f of y, y. So I'm going to take the derivative of f, y with respect to y. So the first times the derivative of the second with respect to y. Um, plus the second times the derivative of the first with respect to y is one. So then we get um, this twos are going to cancel. We get negative y squared times this plus this again. Again, if I factor out x squared plus y squared plus 81 to the 3 halves, negative 3 halves, I'm going to get this negative y squared here. But then um, negative 1 half take away negative 3 halves is going to give me a positive 1 exponent. So then this is going to cancel with this. 
and I'm going to get x squared plus 81 over that denominator. And it'll become positive 3 halves at the bottom. And then f of y, y of 0, 0. This would be 0, 81 over 81 to the 3 halves is also 1 ninth. Okay. So I'm going to come up to the top because I'm kind of running out of room. Um, but D is going to be 1 ninth times 1 ninth minus 0 squared, which is 1 over 81. It is greater than 0. So then we're going to look at fxx, which is 1 ninth. And that is also greater than 0, which means this is going to be a minimum. OK, so this point is going to be a minimum which means I'm going to put my 0, comma, 0, comma, 9. And then for the maximum, I'm going to put D and E. And let's see how it goes. Yay, we got both of our checks. OK, moving on to some more simpler things. This problem was pretty heavy. Lots and lots of algebra, but you need practice with it. So it's not all bad, right? Um, it's annoying, but we need some experience, so we go get it. So in this problem, it's very much the same thing. We can just do exactly what we've been doing. Um, we're gonna first start finding our partial derivatives and finding these critical numbers. So fx is going to be 2x, 0, plus 16, 0, and 0. So fx equal to 0 would tell me that 2x plus 16 equals 0, which tells me x equals negative 8. Then if I find fy, that would be 0, 2y, 0, minus 12, 0. So fy equal to 0 is 2y minus 12 equal to 0, which means y equals 6. So then now I'm going to figure out whether it's a max or min or whatnot, right? So let's see. Um, fxx. The derivative of this with respect to x would be 2. fxy. The derivative of this with respect to y is 0, 0. So 0. And then fyy, the derivative of this with respect to y is 2. So D is going to be 2 times 2 minus 0 squared, which is 4, which is greater than 0. Fxx is equal to 2, which is also greater than 0. So this tells me that I'm going to have a minimum. Lots of minimums today. And if I want to know the Z coordinate of this minimum, I have to plug in the critical number, negative 8 and 6. So I get negative 8 squared plus 6 squared plus 16 times negative 8 minus 12 times 6 plus 4, which is equal to who knows what. It's on 64 plus 36 minus 128 minus 72 plus 4. I get negative 196. So that's my z value. So where's my point? It's at um, negative 8, 6, negative 96, and it's a min. Okay, so negative 8, comma 6, comma negative 96. And then this one is going to be D and E. And let's check it. I don't know if the 96 is correct, but we're going to see. Oh, yeah, it's good. Okay. Now moving on, number four. So we have 78x plus 78y minus x squared minus y squared. So we're going to find fx. That's going to be 78, 0, negative 2x, and 0. So if I set that equal to 0, I'm going to get x equals to 39, I believe. 78 divided by 2. 
Yes. Then Fy is going to be 78 minus 2y. So Fy equal to 0 means that y is also going to be 39. Then if I do my partials, this is going to be negative 2x. That's going to be 0. And that's going to be negative 2. Not negative 2x, just negative 2. So D in this case is going to be negative 2 times negative 2 minus 0 squared, which is 4, which is greater than 0. But Fxx is negative 2, which is less than 0. So that means it's a maximum. Finally, we get something other than a minimum. Oh, you can't see none of my paper. Sorry. Second derivative of x, which would be negative 2. Derivative of uh, the f of x with respect to y. So the derivative of this, but with respect to y is 0. And the derivative of this with respect to y is negative 2. So d is these guys multiplied together minus this guy squared. I got 4 greater than 0, but fx is negative, so it's a maximum. If I want to know the z value, I need to plug in these x's. and the y. I believe I get 78, but I'm not sure. Seven, or not 78, but um, I believe I'm gonna get 3,042. I don't know. Let's see, 78, 39. Plus 78, 39, minus 39 squared, minus 39 squared. Yep, 3042. Okay. Um, so then that's going to be my point. It's going to be 39. 39 and 3042 and max. So no minimum, no saddle point, and I'm gonna have 39 comma 39 comma 3042. Awesome, and let's go on to this one. So now they call it G, but that's okay, it's the same thing. You can rename it F if you really, really want to. Okay, so let's see. G of X is gonna be two X minus three. So then G of X equal to zero is gonna give me X equal to three halves or 1.5, same thing, right? Then G Y is going to be negative two Y minus six. So gy equal to zero is gonna give me y equals negative three. And then gxx is gonna be two. gxy is going to be zero. And gyy is gonna be negative two. So d is gonna be two times negative two minus zero squared, which is gonna be negative four, which is less than zero, which automatically means saddle point. And if it's a saddle point, then that means that um, I need to find the z value. So I'm going to have uh, 1.5 squared minus negative 3 squared, 3 times 1.5 minus 6 times negative 3. So let's see what we get uh, 1.5 squared minus nine, minus three times 1.5, minus, or actually plus 18. I get 6.75. So the point should be 1.5, negative three, and 6.75. You could also type in fractions, but I'm not going to because these are really nice decimals, so they're not too bad. Oops, seven, five. And then I'm going to type in D and E and D and E. 
and let's see how we did. Okay, got all of our checks. Let's go try number six. I get the idea, right? This the same process, it's just different problems and what it's gonna look like for each kind of problem. Um so now we've had an example of a bunch of minimums, a maximum, and a saddle point. Now here the function is 5xy. So when I do gx, it's going to be 5y. When I do gy, it's going to be 5x. Now setting gx equal to 0 to find the critical number is going to tell me that y equals 0. Setting gy equal to zero is going to give me the critical value x equal to zero. And so then I'm going to do my second partial derivatives. Um, derivative with respect to x would be zero. With respect to y would be five. And then the respect to y would be zero. So d is going to be zero times zero minus five squared which is negative 25, which means saddle point. And if I wanna find the Z, I need to plug in the zero and the zero, which gives me zero. So a saddle point is at zero for X, zero for Y, and zero for Z. I'm gonna type zero comma zero comma zero. And then D in E and D in E. And submit. Okay, we're going on. Now we're going to do number seven. Okay, so I got these from my partial derivatives. The problem is, is that I need to solve for x and y, and I do need to set both of them equal to zero. So I end up with the system. I end up with this equal to zero and this equal to zero. And if I multiply the top one by a negative three and the bottom one by a positive two, that will help me eliminate the x variable. So I get negative 6x positive 9y equal to 0. And at the bottom, I will get, um, actually, I should multiply by a negative 3. I should multiply by a positive 3 so that they can cancel. Right? So then that would be positive 6x and minus 9. But 3 times 0 is still 0. Negative 6x, negative 4y equal to 0. These would cancel, but I'd have negative 13y equal to zero. Regardless, I'm gonna get y equals to zero. If I plug that into either equation, I will get the two x equals zero or the x equals zero as well. So my critical number is still zero, zero. And if I wanna find the z, excuse me, I would plug it in and I'm gonna get zero. So the value is gonna be zero, zero, zero. Now, whether it's a minimum, a maximum, or a saddle point, we have not found that out yet. So if I do h, x, x, the derivative of this with respect to x is two. h, um, y, y, the derivative of this with respect to y is negative two. And then h, x, y, the derivative of this guy with respect to y is negative three. So for D, we get two times negative two minus negative three squared, which is negative four minus nine, which is negative 13. And that's less than zero, which means it is a saddle point. Lots and lots of saddle points now. So zero comma zero comma zero. Okay, now number eight. I think I can fit number eight in here, we'll see. 
So I have number eight and we have f of x, y equal to this function. So f x is gonna be negative four x plus two. And then f y is going to be negative eight y minus eight. So f x equal to zero is gonna tell me x equals one half. And then f y equal to zero is gonna give me y equal to negative one. Now, again, all I'm doing is setting these equal to zero and solving the linear equations, not too, too complicated. I can do that in my head. Um, if you need to work out those steps, go for it. If not, you don't, it's not necessary. I mean, it's pretty simple to do in your head. Um, but before I find Z, let's go figure out what kind of point this is. So F X X is negative four. F Y Y is negative eight. And F X Y is zero. So D is gonna be negative four, negative eight minus zero squared which is positive 32, which is greater than zero. So then now I need to look at fxx. That's negative four, which is less than zero, which means this is a maximum, okay? And then if I wanna find z, I gotta plug in one half for x and negative one for y. So negative two times one half squared, negative one squared times one half times negative one, plus two. And so I don't know what we get. Let's see, we get negative one over two um, minus four plus one plus eight plus two. I get 13 over two, which is 6.5. So the point we have is, um, this up, is going to be one half for X or 0 0.5. Um, negative one for y, and then 6.5 for z. And that was a max, so I'm gonna put it in the maximum column. 0 0.5 comma negative one comma 6.5. And then for the other ones, I'm gonna type in D and E. Hopefully it didn't mess up anywhere. Let's see, yeah, it came out correct. Okay, finally, we're at number nine. Okay, for number nine, I, there was a, um, a hint up at the top. And it says, draw the rectangular boundary. So I'm going to make sure that I do that. And then it says, find equations for each boundary line slash segment and the X values that bound that segment, okay? Start with testing one of the lines or the, one of the segments um, and simplify the function, right? Because you're going to have found the equation of the line. So instead of using y, you're going to use the equation of that line instead. Um, and then you're going to evaluate this simple thing, um, this simplified expression at both the end values for the x bounds on the line segment you're testing. This will give you the points um, x, y, z. Find all such points for each line segment. So there will be three, okay? And, or actually you might have six. You might have two for each one, but we'll talk about it in a second um, because you have the bounds, right? One X value and the other X value is the bound. So you'll have two points for one line, two points for another line and two points for the last line. It says, compare them all. The one with the highest Z value is or are, because if multiple of them have the highest, um, value, the multiple can be the maximums. The ones with the lowest Z values are gonna be your minimums, okay? And then anything in between will not be a max or a min. So it sounds like a lot. Um, so you definitely wanna see what the heck is, <laughs> what are we talking about, right? How does this work? So I definitely wanna draw the region, um, this region here that they're talking about. So for number nine, let me write down my function. So there's really no partial derivatives or anything that I'm gonna do here. It's literally just a matter of 
figuring out what my bounds are and then figuring out what's going on within those bounds, okay? So I am in a rectangular or a triangular part, um, one, two, which would be here, zero, one, which would be here, and then one and two, which would be here. So you've got this triangular piece, okay? And essentially what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to use my colors here and I'm going to be working with each piece, okay? The first one I'm gonna do is this one, this side right here, okay? So for that side, I obviously can tell that the slope is, um, it's up one and over one. So I can tell that the slope is going to be one. And I even know that the y-intercept is at positive one. So then in that case, I know that the equation is going to be y equals mx plus b, or just x plus one, OK? And so what am I going to do with that? Um, I'm going to say, instead of f of x, y, I'm going to say f of x comma x plus 1. So I get 15 minus 3x minus 2x plus 1. And if I simplify that, I get 15 minus 3x minus 2x minus 2, or negative 5x plus 13. OK. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna evaluate this function at the points that I'm given. So one point and then the other point. So I'm going to take, um, for this point, the X value is equal to zero. And for the other one, the X value is actually equal to one. So for X equal to one, we get Y, or we get, um, we get Y equal to, um, x plus one, so zero plus one, which equals one. And we get z equal to, what do we get for z? If I plug in zero there, I'll get 13. So the whole point is going to be zero, one, and 13. Then now for x equal to one, I'm going to get y equals, <laughs> I mean, this is not even necessary. If I already know the X value, I could figure out the Y value. And then if I have the Y value and the X value, I could figure out the Z value. So this step is not necessarily required for me to do. It's not necessary. Um, so I don't think I'm gonna repeat that step on the other problems. So I get one plus one, which equals two, which tells me that Z, I guess it's easier to plug it in there, but I could still plug it into the other one. 15 minus three times one minus two times two. I get 15 minus three is 12, 12 minus four is eight. And so then the point I get is one for X, two for Y and eight for Z. Now we're gonna go move on to the other line. So I'm gonna do this line in blue, okay, right here. Now there, I don't have the y-intercept, but I do have this, the slope. It's going down two units and over one. So down two units and over one means my slope is negative two. And if I don't know what the y-intercept, that's okay. I can still figure out the equation by using the point slope formula, if you remember that thing, right? Um, so y minus y1, one and two, so two and then the slope times x minus x1, which was one. So I get y minus two equals negative two x plus two. And if I add two over, I get y equals negative two x plus four. So for here, I'm gonna have x equal to one. And then down here, x is equal to two. So for x equal to one, I get y equal to negative two times one plus four which is two. And then that means Z would be 15 minus three times one minus two times two, which would be 12 minus four is eight. So I get one 
two and eight. Now for x equal to two, I would get negative two times two plus four, which is zero. And then that means for zero, I, or for z, I would get 15 and then three times two, and then two times zero, which is 15 minus six. 15 minus six is nine. So I would get um, two for x, two for x, zero for y, and nine for z. Now I'm gonna move on to the next one. So now I'm gonna do this section right here, okay? And and really, I don't even need, I already have the X and Y. I really just need to find the Z. I don't know why I'm doing all this extra stuff. I guess in my brain, I had to break it down. <laughs> but really, there's not, it's not necessary to do this, right? It's not necessary to do this either. Because you already know the point here is 0, 1. You already know the point there is 1, 2. Isn't that the exact same coordinates I got? And then if I just plug those coordinates in, I get the Z. Okay, so really it's a whole bunch of nonsense for nothing. Um, that's weird. Why did I make it so much more difficult than it needed to be? Weird. I mean, people tend to do that. Obviously, I am a victim of it too. So here I have this point, which is 2 comma 0. And then I have this point, which is 0 comma 1. So if I want to find the z for those values, um, I would do 15 minus 3 times 0 minus 2 times 0 and or 2 times 1. I'm checking this top one. I get 15 minus 2 is 13. So then my point is 0, 1, and 13. Then now for the other z is going to be 15 minus 3 times 2 minus 2 times 0. So I get 9, which means the point is 0, 1, and, and 9. I'm sorry, 2, 0, and 9. Now without all that extra junk, let me check this again. So if x is 0, and y is one, this is 15 minus two, which is 13. Okay, good. And then if I check for one and two, that's 15, three times one, and then two times two. So it's gonna be um, 15 minus three, which is 12, 12 minus four, which is eight. Okay, cool. So these are the six points that we were talking about. And if we wanna find the maximum and the minimum, we're just going to um, figure out who has the highest y value and who has the lowest y value, okay? So the high or z value, the one that has the highest z values are these. This point and this point have the highest z value, okay? And the points that have the, um, and it's actually the same point, isn't it? So that's the maximum. And then for the minimum, we're going to take dun, 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 this, this point here, which has an eight. So it's gonna be one comma two comma eight. This other point, which is the one here and here, it's nine, but nine is in between eight and 13. So let's go ahead and plug this in. I wonder if because I simplified it so much, if it's gonna be correct. I'm hoping that it is. This was a really weird one. We were basically just plugging in all the Z's and making sure that, um, yeah, it does work out. We're plugging in all of the Z's and making sure. Now the question might come, how do we know that this is a maximum or minimum? Like you basically just evaluated the function, the three-dimensional function at all of the endpoints. 
how do I know that what's going on in between there isn't bigger or smaller than what we have, okay? And that's ultimately, I think, why I was doing this, okay? Because if you look at this, your X values are going from zero to one. It doesn't matter what numbers you plug in here from zero to one. When you compute this, the highest value that you're gonna get is 13. The lowest value that you're gonna get is 13 minus five, which is eight, okay? So the highest is 13 and the lowest is eight. Now, had I done the equation part for this other one, um, which we did over here, right? The highest it could be was um, four and the lowest, or actually no, because where's this region going from? This region, the X's are going from one to two, okay? So in here, if I start off with the X values of one, then this would be about two. And then if I keep plugging in bigger numbers, okay, this is gonna shrink this lower and lower until I get to two where it goes to zero. So the maximum here is gonna be between uh, two and the minimum would be zero, okay? But between zero and two, that's not really gonna be anything bigger or smaller than um, the 13. So really nothing's gonna happen right here in the middle. Um, and if I kept doing it for this one over here, I would have gotten um, y equals um, down, down one and over two. So that one would have been negative one half x plus one. And so between the x values zero and two, between zero it would have been at one. And then as I get closer to two, it would have gone to zero again. So it would have been between two and zero. So definitely my maximum is going to be that 13 and then my minimum is going to be that eight. Okay, so we did finish up the 13.8. You don't have to worry about all of the equation stuff. Literally just evaluate your function at all of these three points and then compare the, the Z values. The point with the lowest Z value is going to be your min and the point with the highest Z value is going to be your max, okay? It didn't need to be as complicated as this made it seem, okay? And because of that, I am going to change that comment at the top and just say to evaluate your function at all three of the points to find the corresponding Z values. And then the point with the highest Z value is your maximum and the point with the lowest Z value is your minimum, okay? There's no need to do any of that other stuff that, that was going on, okay? Um, so that is it for this section. I will continue to 13.9 in a moment.